everyone welcome this morning to Hertford Street Baptist Church for our Good Friday service this morning we'll be running a bit differently to what we normally do we'll have um, a number of different readings we'll have a shorter message and we'll be um, ex extinguishing some of these candles as we go this morning is all about remembering the death of the Lord Jesus and so all the readings and singing and thinking on God's word that we'll be doing this morning will be focused on that. We're we going to start this morning with a reading from John chapter 1. We'll be reading from verses 1 to 5 and then 9 to 13. And it'll be on the screen as well. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life, that life, was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The second reading comes from John chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. We're going to stand and sing now, so please join in as we sing Jerusalem.
please take a seat. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful, and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Jesus, or Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. We're now going to pray together as a church, so please join with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, we come together as your people this morning, remembering the death of your son, Jesus. We thank you that it's this death that brings us together, this death that gives us forgiveness and right standing before you through faith. Father, we thank you that it was his will to go to the cross to lay up his life for us and all those who are your people. Thank you that you showed your love for us, that though we were sinners, Christ died for us. That this is love, not that we have loved you, but that you loved us and showed it to us so powerfully on the cross. Father, this morning, help us to remember with thanksgiving all that has been accomplished by the death of your Son. Help us to be reminded of the unity that we share because Christ died for us. And help us to remember the unity we share with believers all around the world who today, no matter their circumstances, are remembering and celebrating what you achieved at the cross. Father, we pray that in the weeks to come, as we look towards Easter Sunday and the hope of the resurrection, that we would not be quick to jump in our mind to this thinking, that we'd remember the way that Christ took your penalty for us, that we remember the great grace you have shown us that's only possible at the cross. Father, for Christians around the world that are remembering this in places where standing out as a believer is risky or dangerous in many ways, Help them to remember the strength that they have 
in Jesus. Help them to know for certain that his death has accomplished for them life and forgiveness. Lord, that no matter what might happen to their mortal bodies here, that this has achieved for them life with you forever. Father, we pray for all our church family, that you would keep strengthening them in faith and knowledge of the good news of Jesus. Help us to be people that delight in your word, delight in speaking it and sharing it with others, especially at this time of the year. Help us to be people that are truly believing and reflecting the good news that it is on Good Friday. And we pray that for those in our midst, in our community that don't yet know Jesus, that today and across the week and in any way that you would show them all that is given and held at hand in your Son. May you save those that don't yet know you and bring them into that same right standing that we know and enjoy and celebrate because of what happened today so long ago. Lord, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our next reading is from uh, Luke 22, verse 39 to 46. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The next reading is from Mark 14, verses 32 to 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words, and again he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand.
we're going to watch a video, so please turn your eyes to the screen. Our next passage is from John 17. We'll start from verses 1 to 6. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name <coughs> to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. We now move ahead to John chapter 17, verses 15 to 24. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. We've already heard so much of what was involved in Jesus leading to the cross. We've heard many of the ways that he suffered to get there. We've seen the way that all those who were close to him, his closest friends, abandoned him in his hour of need. We've seen and we'll see soon how violent the suffering will be as he gets to the cross. This was the most brutal method of killing people in the world at the time of the Roman Empire. And Jesus experienced that for us. 
He died innocently. He alone is the good shepherd who leads his people, and yet the supposed leaders of the people led him to death, dying but with no reason to die from his own works. All of these things are great things, and yet the biggest pain and suffering he experienced was that he took God's full penalty for our sin. As he was praying in the garden, that was the weight of his prayers. That was the cup that he was praying about. And yet he did it willingly and under his Father's will. He took all God's wrath that we deserve for our sin, that we might know forgiveness and life in him. He suffered and died in our place. It means that for all with faith in him, there's no longer fear of judgment, of us receiving God's wrath and punishment, because he has taken it already. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the perfect man, living in perfect obedience to his Father, becomes the sin of the world, that we might receive his righteousness. Paul again says in Colossians 2.13 that you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. For those of us that know Jesus, those of us that are considering faith in Jesus, there's no sin that we have had in our life before or now in the future that isn't dealt with at the cross. All of it, as he is nailed there, is nailed there with him. Nothing escapes it. Peter, in 1 Peter 2.22, says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. As Paul and Peter and later Christians reflect on the work at the cross, it's central in what it means for us to be Christians. Without the cross, we don't have any hope of forgiveness. We don't have any hope of restoration between us and God. And so as we gather on days like this, it's right for us, even on a somber and sad day, to have joy and thanksgiving because of who we now are as people made sons and daughters, people with close and forever access to God, people who no longer fear his judgment because of the cross. We are going to spend more time on Sunday thinking about what that hope looks like of life forever with him. But for today, our focus is the cross. There's a few more parts of our service left, but before I head out, there's a few announcements. When we head out to morning tea today, um, we'll be having some hot cross buns, which sounds great. But... We'll be ending the service quietly and walking out silently. And so 
when the last reading has been finished, the last candle has been extinguished. You could have some moments of reflection, but please walk out quietly and head over into the hall. As I was already saying, Easter Sunday, we'll be meeting again as usual at nine o'clock and celebrating that Jesus did not stay in the grave, but was raised to life, offering hope of our own resurrected, eternal life with God to come. And so please come back for that. This is part of the gospel that we've heard today, but this hope of life is the other part. So please do join us again for Sunday. And if you or someone you know would like to explore and consider that hope that we have in Jesus, whether for the first time or again after a long time, we have some events coming up in April called Hope Explored. We're across three Monday nights with dinner and discussion and some listening to talks. We'll consider that hope that we have in Jesus hope that is one at the cross and a hope that we have assurance in in the resurrection. So please consider joining and registering on the website um, and even bringing someone along for it because there's no other hope that can match that hope that we've shared because of Jesus and his death and resurrection. We're going to stand now and sing in response as we sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
please take a seat. Our final readings come from the book of John and then the book of Mark. Please follow with me on the screen or in your Bibles if you have them. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. And then in Mark, and the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. 